Good morning, everyone. Um, we are still uh, waiting for some participants to join. So just one minute, probably. Um, So probably we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. I wish you a very warm welcome from Barros Rasuris here in Santiago. Ich begrüße euch sehr herzlich zu unserer Darstellung. This will be displayed and performed in, in English. Um, so I will introduce our constitutional committee who has been joining and following all the, the developments that we are facing as a country for these challenging times since more than a year now. Um, this, this committee is, 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 is integrated by uh, Nicolas Tolmacea, who is a partner at Barros Rasuris in the projects and finance team. Uh, we have also Fernanda Espinosa. She's a senior associate in, in our labor and immigration practice area. And we have Jose Luis Corvalan, a uh, partner in our litigation and dispute resolutions um, practice area. Uh, the, the, this presentation should take uh, around 45 minutes. And the, the, the idea is that after that 45 minutes, we will we we'll have 15 more minutes for questions and answers. So everyone to, you can send your questions by the chat or you can turn your camera and your mic on and, uh, and ask directly to the panelists your, your questions. So when, when, while we are presenting, uh, we'll ask you to, to mute and turn your mics and turn your camera off, please. We will, so Nicolás Balmacea, please. The room, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kamchal, for this uh, interesting opportunity to discuss about this uh, process that the country is uh, enduring. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor for us, the Constitutional Committee at Barros y Rasuris, to take part of this conversation with uh, Camchal Affiliates. And, Sergio, and thank you, Sergio, as director of Camchal, for this opportunity. Um, we would like to, to discuss with you in the following 45 minutes what's uh, been this process so far and what we can expect from it. Uh, we have called this presentation Understanding the Chilean Constitutional Process from an International Perspective. And we give some pointers and um, tips for uh, investors, in foreign and also locals, um, about the, the outcome that we are foreseeing in the, in the, in the process that, that, that the country is uh, experiencing. As, as you will see in the next slide, uh, we are going to divide our uh, presentation in, in, in six uh, sections. Uh, first of all, we're going to have a, a short discussion on, on constitutions. Why are we so um, in, thrilled, some people uh, nervous, uh, intrigued about, about a, a process as the one that Chile is um, experience um, in connection with its constitution. Then we're going to discuss the process, how it has been so far and what's uh, ahead. Uh, later, we are going to talk about scenarios that uh, we are foreseeing for, for the country. And uh, by, by the end, we are, are going to focus on protection of property rights, which is one of the main focus for investors uh, when constitutional discussions are um, taking place in, in countries, uh, there is international experience about this, and we can have a little discussion on that. 
then international treaties who should play a major role in, in terms of uh, making to prevail the rule of law to end at, at the end of the um, presentation with a Q&A questions and answers section, which as uh, Sergio mentioned, it, uh, could be made uh, through your camera and speakers or through the chat uh, feature that um, this platform has. Very well. And talking uh, briefly on uh, constitutions, uh, this is what you are seeing. It's called the the Kelsen uh, pyramid. Kelsen was Hans Kelsen was an Austrian uh, philosopher and jurist, who is the main responsible for the Weimar Constitution, which uh, I'm sure some of you are um, uh, well aware of. And in his theory, he explained that all uh, legal rules should work as an uh, as a system. Uh, which is uh, designed as a pyramid. And on top of that pyramid, we have a constitution. What is a constitution basically is the fundamental law of a republic. And this is why it's, it's so important because all other rules should be well aligned uh, in, in connection with this constitution. And that's why we have CPR on top of our pyramid, the Constitución Política de la República the Republic uh, political constitution. This superior norm organized the power of the state and limits it in order to guarantee the rights and liberties of the people. It established the basis and principles that govern the constitution and legal system in general. So basically two roles a constitution should play. On one hand, it to organize uh, the power of the state. And uh, in, in, in the other hand, uh, to limit that power in order to guarantee rights and freedom to um, to the people. The principle of constitutional supremacy, it's uh, what Hans Kelsen um, worked throughout his life. He has a, a very interesting life for those of you who want to find out a, a bit more. Um, uh, he escaped from, from Europe uh, in, in, in the 40s and ended up in, in, the, in the United States of America uh, as a professor of law in the most um, respectable uh, universities as uh, Princeton and UCLA as, as well. And, and, and what he ex explained to us is uh, these well-organized systems of law, which at the end, what they uh, want is to have uh, a rule of law that is um, consistent. In our next slide, we can uh, discuss a bit about the Chilean uh, history on, on constitutions. How many constitutions Chile has had uh, at, at 10, but really there has been only three important and lasting um, constitutions. There were some uh, what there were called constitutional essays. Uh, you see those those dates, very short uh, survival of uh, these constitutional essays in 1811, 12, 14, 18, 22, 23, and 28. But, but by 1833, Chile um, adopted uh, his first uh, real constitution, uh, which lasted for over 90 years. Then, um, through a, a process of uh, a, a political process, uh, Chile adopted a new one in 1925, which derives from the, the previous one in, 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 in a good deal. Uh, and, and that constitution uh, was in place for 75 years. Then a new political pro, um, process um, ex was um, experienced by the, by the country, a dramatic one. And, and in 1980, we adopted the new constitution, a new constitution, which is the one that uh, we have in place um, right now. That constitution has lasted for 40 years. Um, the, the 1980 um, constitution adopted during the military uh, government and the military rule in the country uh, has been um, uh, amended uh, repeatedly. As you can see, uh, the first amendment in 1981 um, was um, in, included uh, 54 modifications or amendments to that constitution. And then there have been several, over 40 reforms to date. 
The most uh, noticeable one uh, was in 2005 under uh, Pres President Lagos' uh, regime, and uh, that one had uh, f 54 modifications. What, what, what is this telling us is that constitutions can be uh, amended or can be replaced. Uh, as we can see, uh, this country has uh, um, opted to replace constitution uh, three, three times in the past uh, 200 years. Uh, which is not that many, actually, when you compare it with uh, international experience. Um, um, we will see that uh, this is uh, the process that we are enduring is not uh, a, a, a strange or uh, unknown one in, in, in constitutional history worldwide. <clears throat> Constitutions in the world, uh, we can see that, that there are 19 countries with only one constitution. Um, that, in other words, most of the country, over 200 countries, have uh, had uh, at least two or more constitutions, which tell us that the, um, that the, can the countries may opt to uh, adopt a new constitution instead of uh, amend uh, amending the one existing. The most uh, noticeable one um, constitution in the world is the United States Constitution, which is the oldest one, uh, adopted in 1789. Uh, not all the countries call their constitution constitution, actually. Uh, um, one of the, the, the most well-known, the English uh, constitution has, uh, it, it, it doesn't work as a constitution per se, the, the Carta Magna uh, um, is not included in, in, this, in this list because it's a different set of rules, but uh, it, even Germany actually doesn't call uh, their superior norm constitution. Um, the, I, I, I believe that the, the German constitution is called the basic law for the Federal Republic of Germany, which was adopted in, in May in, in, 19, in 1949. And it doesn't go under the name of constitution, but it does work uh, as, as a constitution. On the other hand, uh, we have countries, uh, next slide, please, thank you. Uh, we have countries with uh, several constitutions. This is a list of the countries with more constitutions in the world. As you can see, uh, most of them in, in Latin America, Dominican Republic, for instance, 33, Venezuela, 26, Haiti, 24. Um, in Europe, we have France, surprisingly, uh, with 16, Greece, with 13, in, in Asia, we have uh, Thailand with 17. So as you can see, the, uh, the international experience, it's, uh, it's very broad. We have uh, a whole array of countries with different experiences, with several constitutions, with uh, just a few constitutions. And, uh, and the results are, uh, are hard to categorize because there, there is so, so many experiences uh, which would do, don't go under just one pattern. <clears throat> so when we have uh, this uh, broad range of constitutions and when we in Chile are facing the challenge of adopting, adopting a new one, we can uh, ask ourselves what is the type of constitution that we want to adopt? And what are the constitutional models in, in, in the world? Basically, the, the constitutional experts categorize uh, the constitution in two different models, the maximalism or the minimalism. Uh, that is to say, a very detailed and thorough constitution or a constitution with just very broad and general principles. Um, and, and, and that's uh, the work that the, the Constitutional Committee or Convention, the Chilean Constitutional Convention, is, uh, is, uh, is doing now, is to uh, decide, or should be doing now, right? May, what one may ask or think. Um, they should adopt one of these models and they should work in, in order to give uh, Chile a, a new constitution. Are they going to adopt a sort of a maximalism model like Colombia did, for instance? In Colombia, they went through a, 
a similar process as the one that we are facing now, and uh, they adopt a extremely detailed constitution in um, 1991. It has uh, 380 articles. For having a reference, the Chilean constitution nowadays has uh, 150 articles. It was born the, in the 80s with 120, 119 articles. And there has been amend amendments uh, that included new articles, and today we have 150 articles. Well, the Colombian Constitution has 380 articles. On the other hand, we have the United States of America uh, Consti Constitution, which has only seven articles, very, very broad, um, broad general principles, uh, but they have been amend amending that Constitution throughout the, the times. The Chilean model, it, uh, you, you wouldn't say it's uh, properly a, a, a maximalism uh, model uh, nor a minimalism. Uh, some people say it's a mixed system uh, where we do have uh, general principles, but in some, in, in some subject matters, we do have a detailed regulation in our, in our constitution. Uh, in the 80s, our constitution opted for, for this mixed system, uh, and uh, it is composed by three parts, we may say. The general principle in, the, um, in this style, Amer American style, if you want, of um, declaration of general principles on, on the basis of which our legal system is regulated and configured. Then we have the dogmatic part which regulates the fundamental rights and guarantees of all persons. And there uh, we do have a detailed regula regulation, which is a, 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 good, a good thing in, uh, for in, in, some, in some specific rights, uh, which are very relevant. And we don't want to uh, give uh, much freedom to the, uh, to the authority um, to go over them. And then in the organic part, we do have a, an organizational structure of public powers, uh, including the principle of separation of powers, check and balances. As a, just as, as a preview of the Chilean constitution, we can see in this uh, slide uh, how it is organized. It has 15 chapters. And as you can see, the most important uh, legal aspects of uh, life uh, are regulated in the Chilean constitution. <coughs> the chapter one is the institutional foundation basis of the country. And second, nationality and citizenship. Uh, chapter third, very important, constitutional rights and duties of the citizens. Four, government five national congress six judiciary seven office of the public prosecutor eight constitutional court nine electoral and justice and service ten office of the general controller of the republic eleven armed forces twelve national security council 13 central bank, 14 gover government and international administration of the state, and 15 constitutional reform. We have highlighted, uh, as you can see, some chapters are in red and some others are in, the, in black. Well, in red, uh, there is this um, rule for amending the constitution of a quorum of two thirds of deputies and senators in exercise. So this is the highest quorum that we have in our legal system. In order to amend these chapters uh, of the Constitution, we need a two thirds of deputies and senators in exercise. This is the same quorum that is applicable to the Constitutional Convention. So when the, the agreement in order to have a new Constitution was um, set uh, in place uh, by the, most of the political forces, they agreed uh, to use an existing quorum in our constitution, which was the most uh, strict one, um, in, in order to uh, assure uh, ample consensus in order to adopt a new constitution. In black, we have uh, three fifths of the deputies and senators in exercise uh, in order to amend our const constitution. Um, if you ask me, uh, we some of those chapters uh, could um, 
are, are not strictly required to be in the Constitution. For, for instance, electoral justice and service or national security councils, they uh, respond to a different time in the 80s uh, that were crucial issues in, in the country. And nowadays, I don't think that they are needed in a constitution. Unfortunately, I believe that for for how the conventional constitution has been developing, uh, it's, it's probably that we are going to have a longer constitution. If I had to bet my money, I would say that we are going to have a longer constitution than the 80s instead of a, a shorter version of it. OK. So uh, as relevant part of uh, a, a constitution, this is a chapter one of uh, the Chilean constitution. Uh, again, it, it is a pyramid and it's a, it is an in interesting pyramid because are the basis, uh, the institutional foundation basis of uh, Chile uh, is that in first place we have the person. The people are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Our society built itself based on a person, an individual. And then on top of that, we have a, a, a second layer, which is the family. The family is the fundamental nucleus of the society in accordance with uh, the Chilean constitution. All of these uh, quotes are part of our constitution. And then on a third layer, we have the intermediate groups. Uh, the state recognizes and protects the intermediate groups through which society is organized and structured and guarantees them adequate autonomy to fulfill their own specific purposes. This is something that it's been called the subsidiary principle, right? And uh, there is an interesting discussion nowadays in connection with education, because as you have seen, the Constitutional Convention didn't want to uh, expressly recognize the freedom of the families or, uh, and the intermediate groups to uh, organize uh, education, basically um, um, high school, college, um, or um, colleges, uh, and in, in educational institutions um, on on their own. And it's, there there is a more um, uh, vision from a from the state point of view in terms of the, the relevance that uh, the the role that uh, those parties have to have to play in the in the organization of the education and finally uh, this is the actual philosophy of the 80s constitution it, it is the state and the state is at the service of the human person and its purpose is to promote the common good. This is uh, how the, the current constitution um, is organized and it remains to be seen whether this philosophy is going to be changed or not. <clears throat> As per relevant part of the constitutional discussion, Article 19 establishes the fundamental rights and guarantees for the individual. As you can see, there are three generations of rights and these are called generation because they appear in the human history, history on different times. The first right were the civil and political rights. You can see in the column at, at, at your left, equality before law, due process, property right, uh, right to vote, uh, very relevant um, basic rights. Then on a second generation of rights, uh, we had the economic, social, and cultural rights, which we can uh, point them to mid fifties with United Nations appearance as an international player. And then uh, countries uh, started to recognize uh, right to health, uh, protection, education, freedom of labor, uh, social security, when societies were uh, more advanced, when there were more resources, when pi pi uh, countries um, get richer, uh, there was this chance to um, guarantee economic, social and cultural rights. And then we have a third generation of rights. Um, which are summarized as justice, peace, and solidarity. And in Chile, in this third generation, uh, there is only recognition to the right to live in a pollution and free environment. It is uh, likely that we are going to see new rights recognized as part of the, this third generation rights, where Chile perhaps has been um, uh, dragging or been behind of the international trend. Uh, for instance, people um, usually mention the right to a to have a de decent housing. Uh, that's something that uh, the new constitution 
possibly may uh, contemplate. So, uh, as a way to summarize and um, um, and to, to end my, my, my part, uh, why is the Constitution important? Uh, basically, we have summarized here some of the reasons that we have already discussed. Because uh, this, uh, the Constitution establishes a system of how the citizens can demand their fundamental rights. Uh, we have at least three constitutional actions that uh, we can uh, actually uh, pursue uh, in the judicial uh, system. The, what it's called the appeal for protection or recurso de protección, the economic protection, and the writ of protection, which is the recurso de amparo. Those are uh, very fast, uh, expedient ways to uh, get your constitutional rights in place if they have, that there is a, a breach by the authority or by, by, by third parties. The Constitution is also important because it organized the uh, law formation process. It established the types of law, it established a constitutional court, uh, which is actually, it's one of the things that we, we uh, inherited from the Weimar Constitution. The Weimar Constitution in the 20s was the first one to consider a constitutional court. Uh, then it, it established some quorums um, in, in order to guarantee broad consensus in, in, in the adoption of laws, and there is a preventive measure um, to a sort of a quality control, quality assurance and quality check con uh, system uh, to uh, avoid uh, uh, adopting laws that uh, may, may have uh, fundamental problems. And finally, is uh, uh, sorry in the in the previous one, uh, the control between powers and organs of the state. At the, at the right side of the slide, uh, we have uh, this uh, organization. You saw it in the list of chapters. Uh, the executive power, legislative power, and judicial power are regulated in our constitution, and also uh, another uh, other uh, organs as con the constitutional court, armed forces, and the general control of the republic. And uh, as my last uh, slide, what are the topics for next discussions? You can see it on your screen. Um, these are, the, in, in our opinion, the main issues that should be discussed. Economic and social rights, uh, the president as co-legislator or exclusive initiative uh, to create laws. Housing, we already mentioned that, foreign investment, property rights. This is a, a group of the subject matters that we believe are going to take the agenda of the country in the following six months. Thank you very much. And with no further ado, I leave the room to Maria Fernanda to explain us about the process of adopting a new constitution in Chile. Thank you, Nicolás. Um and good morning, everyone. Um, so now we are going to review uh, the constitutional process currently underway in Chile and its rules. Uh, first, uh, it's important to introduce briefly how this constitutional process arises uh, for those uh, who may do not know it. In October 2020, uh, most of the voting citizens approved in a national referendum the decision to begin a process to eventually replace the current constitution. Um, this historic referendum was agreed uh, to by most of Chilean political authorities to provide an institutional response to the social and political crisis that began in Chile after a widespread social unrest that sparked on October 2019. The process that we are going to review uh, is regulating several provisions that were introduced to the current constitution, uh, who orders that a convention formed by 155 delegates shall draft a constitutional text, which will afterward be subject to a national referendum, uh, also called exit referendum. So as you can see in this timeline, on October 2020 uh, was the referendum, uh, the entrance referendum. Uh, then on May this year took place the election of the 155 delegates of the Constitutional Convention. Then on July 4th, uh, start the convention work. And uh, on mid-2022, it's expected uh, to um, took place the exit referendum. 
Um, on July 4th, uh, the first session of the convention took place. Um, from that date began the work period of the convention. Uh, the convention has a period uh, of nine months to write and approve a constitutional text. Um, and this period may be extended on a one-time basis just for three more months. Um, after that, uh, as I already mentioned, a ratifying referendum uh, to approve or reject the new constitution uh, will be held in mid-2022. Um, on the first session, uh, the 155 elected constitutional members elect Elisa Loncon as a president and Jaime Vasa as a vice president. Elisa Loncon uh, is a constituent for a seat reserved for indigenous people. Uh, she holds a PhD in humanities and linguistics from the University of Leiden and is a professor at the University of Santiago. Jaime Vasa has a PhD in law from the University of Barcelona and is currently a professor of constitutional law at the University of Valparaiso. Uh, during this almost three months of work, uh, the convention um, also has been um, doing uh, some, some work. Uh, uh, among this, among the, the work that is, uh, has been done, uh, the assembly also has approved enlargement of the board of director. Um, um, it uh, has um, add seven additional members to the board of directors. So, um, so now it's compound by nine members, not only the, pro the president and vice president. Uh, also, eight provisional operating commissions were formed, um, which have their respective coordinators. Um, the most relevant of these commissions are the rules of procedure, ethics, and budget and administration. Each of these um, provisional commissions has established its own operating rules. Um, and the actual constitutional work of the convention is expected to begin in early October. Uh, to begin uh, the, the actual work, it's necessary um, to have uh, already the rules of procedure, the, the also called reglamento. Without the reglamento, um, the convention cannot start uh, the substantive work. So that's its importance to do that. Um, the rules of procedure were, um, were already approved in general, and this week the delegate uh, should vote the indications presented to the rules of procedure. So the final text of the rules of procedure should be, um, should be ready this week or this September. That's uh, the idea that the convention has. Um, and the, these final regulations, which among other aspects will establish the voting rules and final commissions. And as I mentioned, it's very important to the convention could start the, the real work. What we are, every, that everyone is, is waiting for. So uh, let's review now, what are the rules governing this constitutional making process? So first thing, it's necessary to specify that these rules, uh, I already mentioned this, but these rules are established in the current constitution. Therefore, only if the current constitution is amended, will it be possible to change the rules that we are going to review. So first, the convention must approve the constitutional provisions by two thirds majority. Um, it has been some debates on this two thirds uh, majority rule, and actually um, some decisions of the convention has been by majority. But uh, there is an agreement, I think, that uh, substantive rules and the uh, rules of procedure um, require the two thirds agreement. So uh, I think it's kind of clear that. Um, also, as I already mentioned previously, uh, the Constitutional Convention has a term of nine months uh, to draft this new constitution. Uh, this period can be extended only once for three more months. And to extend this period, uh, it would be necessary to, to make a constitutional amendment. 
So um, regarding the, the first task, task that, the, that the convention uh, has, um, we already reviewed this, but um, the, at the first session, the convention shall elect president and vice president. Uh, this already happened. Um, the convention shall enact rules of procedure. Um, this is what um, uh, the convention has been working during this month. And also the convention shall establish a technical secretariat. Um, this technical secretariat is made up of a specialist of proven academic or professional suitability and are the persons who will help draft the constitutional text according to the instructions uh, they receive uh, from the, the delegates. So let's review now what is the role of the convention and the limitations. It's very important to highlight that constitutional convention only has the authority to discuss and propose the text of, the text of a new constitution. Um, this is the unique purpose of the convention. Therefore, the, the convention may not intervene in or play any other role that correspond to other state agencies or officials. And while the new constitution is not approved, uh, the current constitution shall remain in full force and the convention shall not be able to deny authority or modify it. Um, also the convention or any of its member shall be prohibited from assuming the exercise of sovereignty, assuming powers others and those expressly recognized for them by the current constitution. Um, also it's very important that the new constitution uh, must preserve the republic form of government, uh, its democratic regime, um, and guarantee compliance with current rulings, uh, court rulings, sorry, as well as respect all uh, international treaties, uh, which is something uh, Jose Luis is going to review in more details uh, in more detail later in this presentation. Um, it's relevant to mention that there is a claim um, before the Supreme Court. The delegates have the possibility to file a claim before the Supreme Court in case of infringement of uh, procedural rules. Uh, this is important because it uh, cannot be for a substantive aspect, just uh, procedural. Uh, but this claim uh, will be heard by five Supreme Court justices um, to send uh, randomly for each issue raised. Um, this claim um, can be filed by at least uh, one fourth of the member of the convention. This is uh, 39 constituents within five days of the knowledge of the defect. And the Supreme Court uh, may only annul the claim act and no action or appeal is allowed against the Supreme Court decision. Uh, Jose Luis, uh, please, can you? Oh, okay, so let's see the exit referendum. So, when the work of the convention is completed, uh, the convention must submit its proposed constitutional text to the president of Chile with a call uh, for a new referendum uh, to be held 60 days after uh, notice is issued. Um, the voting uh, in this referendum uh, will be mandatory and Chilean citizens must approve or reject uh, the proposed uh, new constitution. If it's approved, uh, the new constitution will be enacted. And if it's rejected, the current constitution will stand. Also, it's important to highlight that after submitting uh, the draft of the new constitution, uh, the convention must immediately dissolve. And the constituents uh, are disqualified from, from holding public positions um, from one year after the convention is dissolved. Um, and now, uh, Jose Luis uh, will review some political issues and key aspects to take into account uh, regarding uh, this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, now, as Fernanda mentioned, I will make a little bit of uh, initial preliminary political analysis and predictions because of course uh, we don't know what would happen but uh, uh, we can make certain assessment uh, with the uh, information available, available up to this date. 
this is the actual <laughs> uh, composition, political composition of this convention. Uh, uh, Vamos por Chile, that is the right wing alliance has less uh, than a third of the total uh, members of the convention and the, and the, and the rest uh, of the convention is more left wing uh, inclined, but it's very, as you can see, it's very atomized. So uh, we don't know yet if these left wing uh, alliances uh, are going to work as a block or if they will have uh, some differences uh, between them. Uh, some numbers, some figures about the convention. Uh, we have uh, 138 members and 17 seats that have been uh, re uh, reserved for originarian people, the First Nations of the country. Uh, we have uh, 51 militants of political parties, but the majority of the convention is uh, composed by independents. And, and this brings a lot of uncertainty uh, about how they are going to behave and the alliances that will be made because they are not uh, ruled by the political uh, parties. We have a, a almost equal composition of the assembly, uh, 78 men and 77 women. Uh, one of the men of the uh, man that uh, uh, one of the uh, a constitutional um, convention member that, that is a man he uh, re resigned uh, a couple of days ago so probably we will have a completely equally composition of 77 women and men uh, most of them are, are, are lawyers but uh, 60 of them, but then, then you have 90 of very different uh, backgrounds and professions. The, the average age is 45 years. That is uh, relatively young compared with our other institutions uh, as the Senate of the Chambers of Deputies. Uh, the younger constituent has only a, a 20 years old. Uh, so it's, it's very, very young and, and uh, it has a very, very strong regional, regional emphasis. Uh, a lot of uh, constituents campaign based on regional demands, and this may impact in the importance that is allocated to issues like uh, environmental issues and also uh, the, 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 the system of government and more decent, decentralization. Uh, as I was saying, this has... Uh, uh, Political scientists have been analyzing the ideological positions of the members of the convention, and it's clearly more uh, inclined to the left. But as I was mentioning before, uh, it's not a rigid block of left-wing uh, conventionals, so there there may be differences between them and, and different alliances or, or 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 different positions depending on the on the issues at the stake. Um, we don't know yet exactly how they think and, and what are their, what will be their definitive position regarding certain key issues that uh, Nicolas mentioned at the beginning. All, all that we know up to this date, because they have been mainly discussing about procedural issues, uh, is based on on the on their campaigns and the and the programs that they present to to the community to to be elected, and and based on on that programs, uh, we can make an estimation, not, not us, but uh, political scientists have made an estimation of, of we, we, who, who, which would be the majority, majoritarian positions re regarding these key issues. For example, regarding the participation of the state in the economy, clearly the, there is a, a, a majoritarian um, uh, intention of increasing um, the participation of the state in the economy, even establishing a mandatory state participation in certain specific areas. Uh, regarding the, 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 the central bank, uh, and this has been a very discussed issue, especially because uh, currently we are facing uh, 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 an increase in the inflation rates that we had not seen in the last decade. Uh, we can see that uh, there isn't uh, a majoritarian support for uh, depriving the central bank of their uh, independence that is recognized by, by our current 
juridical um, system, but there is a, a lot of voices uh, claiming for more uh, uh, recognized more functions to a central bank and more coordination with the executive power. So we probably uh, won't see uh, uh, a derogation or of the independence of the central bank, but probably we will see a change in their in the in their in its functions uh, and a mandate for more coordination with the fiscal policy uh, of the executive power. Uh, and this, as I was mentioning before, this has been a, a, a hotly discussed topic because uh, there is clearly a, a, a huge change in the history of inflation in Chile since the establishment of the independence of the central bank uh, back to, in 1989. You, you can see that before 1989, our inflation rates were very, very, very high. This was uh, an endemic problem of the Chilean economy. But after the establishing the establishment of the uh, uh, organic autonomy of the central bank, our red rates of inflation have felt in a very impressive way. This can be seen more graphically in this in this image. So, uh, of course, there, there is a lot of concern about how the uh, a potential uh, the, uh, change regarding the independence of or, or autonomy of the central bank may uh, affect our inflation rates. Uh, as I was saying before, probably we won't see. Uh, I, I, this is my personal opinion based on the, the discussion. Probably uh, the, the central bank will remain independent and autonomous, but there will be a mandate for uh, uh, for more coordination with the executive power and a wide uh, array of uh, functions more, more concerned about, for example, employment or economic growth and not only uh, monetary aspects. Uh, Regarding property rights, this is also a hotly discussed topic. Uh, probably we will uh, remain recognizing proper, the property right in the constitution, but uh, also probably we will see uh, there is a majoritarian uh, tendency uh, claiming for new and greater limited limits to property rights. So this is something that uh, may happen and, and, may, and I think that may have an impact in, in, in foreign investment as we will mention uh, later. Uh, regarding, uh, as I was mentioning, foreign investment, uh, we probably based on the, on the initial positions of the constituents, we won't see a, a ban uh, on foreign investment in the country, but probably the constitution will uh, establish uh, some kind of uh, regulations, more tight regulations to foreign investment, and uh, maybe forbidding it in certain strategic sectors, or maybe permitting it only in some activities that don't uh, uh, con uh, constitute a threat to national security, etc. Uh, uh, we we currently in Chile we have a very welcoming um, system for uh, legal system for foreign investment, and this may change uh, for, uh, through. To a system of more tight regulations, specifically regarding certain sectors that are more sensitive, uh, based on what are the initial approaches of the constituents. Uh, regarding property rights, uh, that is, uh, of course, a, a topic of concern for all of us. Uh, it's important to, and also international treaties, it's important to to remember something that uh, uh, Fernanda mentioned before. One of the rules that govern this uh, constitutional process uh, established in the current article 155 of the constitution is that this new constitution that will be enacted by this convention uh, should respect international treaties ratified by Chile and which are enforced. And this is a key provision, but even, even if, this, the, if, if, if this key provision didn't exist, it's a, it's a fact but that Chile is bound. And, and when I say Chile, I mean the Chilean state including the, the Constitutional Convention, is bound by uh, different uh, international treaties that Chile has signed, uh, especially in the last 30 years as a part of Chilean uh, decision to, to open its economy to a world and to, and to, be, to, to adopt a, a multilateral uh, policy. Um, Chile is bound by several treaties that uh, uh, protect not only property rights, but also uh, specifically 
uh, international investment. So on the one hand, Chile is a party to the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Convention, what we call the Pact of San Jose de Costa Rica, that has a clear mandate of protection of property rights, not only applicable to real estate property, but also to mobiles. Um, so uh, this treaty uh, should be respected by the state of Chile, including the Constitutional Convention, um, not only because of the mandate of the referred Article 135, but also because this is a, a treaty that is enforced that the Chilean state must respect in any case. And very important for the specific purpose of this presentation, uh, Chile, as part of the uh, politic of uh, opening its economy to the world that I was mentioning before, uh, from from the from the return of the democracy in 1990 has uh, uh, executed several uh, investment protection treaties uh, not only bilateral investment treaties uh, uh, as we as, as they are called in english um, that up to this date are uh, 55 but also other kind of treaties um, uh, that have chapters that refer to investment pr protection, for example, uh, free trade agreements that have investment protection treaties or, or other kind of cooperation uh, agreements that have specific pro provisions regarding the, the protection of foreign investment. And, uh, uh, and these three uh, treaties that Chile has uh, executed um, bring protection to foreign investment coming from, I would say, almost uh, all countries of the world. Uh, uh, with Germany, uh, talking specifically about Germany, the, the bilateral investment treaty between Chile and Germany was one of the first uh, bits that was executed um, by, uh, by Chile after the return to the democracy um, in 1991. And uh, preparing this presentation, I remember that uh, in fact, Germany uh, was the first country in the world that executed a bilateral investment treaty back in 1959. Uh, the, the, the first bid was executed be between West Germany and Pakistan. So Germany uh, is, was a pioneer in the development of this kind of tools uh, that uh, uh, whose, whose purpose is to promote and protect uh, foreign investment. Uh, up to this date, as I was referring before, Chile has been a very welcoming economy to foreign investment. Uh, and as, as a consequence of that, uh, Chile has not faced many international proceedings uh, 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 implying a, a breach of these treaties. Uh, up to this date, Chile has had only uh, five cases in the before exit, that is usually the the uh, is the 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 forum in which this kind of uh, disc discrepancies is uh, known. Chile, Chile up to this date has only had uh, five cases. Uh, it has won all these cases. So uh, political, uh, the Chilean legal defense has been very successful. Uh, but uh, we have been uh, seeing in the last uh, year, uh, not only as a consequence of this uh, process, process, but also regarding certain measures that Chile has taken uh, in order to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, not only from a sanitary perspective, but also an economic perspective, we, uh, Chile has taken some certain measures, uh, for example, allowing the withdrawal of life, life annuities uh, that have uh, triggered uh, claims by foreign investors uh, before exit. And also some in the, in the infrastructure sector, we have seen also claims that have been brought to exit by um, by, by foreign investors. And, and if the process, and depending on of which, which is the way in which this conventional process uh, will lead us, if in certain way the, the new text of the constitution affects property rights or uh, limits um, current foreign investments in the country, uh, in, uh, constituting a, a breach of these uh, international treaties that are enforced and that Chile must respect, uh, we may we may uh, see a, a huge increase in the number of claims uh, presented uh, before exit against the state of Chile. It's, it's something that may happen may happen depending on the specific way in which this process develops. Uh, these international treaties, just to make a very short summary of their main provisions, usually uh, contemplate uh, certain guarantees to uh, international investors. 
uh, meaning uh, na national treatment, the right to be treated equally to national investors, a fair and equitable treatment, meaning the right not to be not to face arbitrary or capricious uh, measures or discriminatory uh, measures, a most favored nation treatment, meaning that uh, international investors have uh, the right to be to receive the best uh, treatment that Chile has guaranteed to foreign investors, and, and probably the most important of all, the right to be compensated in case of expropriation or nationalization, including not only direct expropriation, that is the probably the, the, the most uncommon, but also I, I indirect expropriation that uh, as a consequence of tight uh, regulations. And these, uh, all these guarantees can, um, uh, can be the, the basis of a claim uh, against the Chilean state in international forums. As I, went, as I was mentioning, the main ones of these forums is ICSID, but also these treaties usually contemplate also the possibility of uh, bringing these claims uh, uh, before the permanent court of arbitration or um, before an arbitration based on ancestral ad hoc rules. And just a minor advice, uh, uh, usually these treaties has what, what are called a fork in the road clauses, that meaning that the investors, if the investor has um, is, is affected by a, a measure adopted by the Chilean state that, that constitutes a breach of the treaty, the, the investor has to make a, a definitive election between uh, bringing this claim before domestic or international courts. So the, the advice, the, this short advice, if, if you are interested in a more uh, uh, developed advice, of course we can provide it, but the short advice is that if you have a problem regarding a foreign investment in Chile, you must be very careful before starting any action before Chilean domestic courts, because that may affect your right to bring the case before international forums. Uh, be, uh, apart from these uh, international treaties, we here in Chile have a foreign a domestic foreign investment legislation. Uh, um, uh, a, a couple of years ago, this was uh, consecrated in the decree law 600 that was repealed, but it's uh, still applicable to investment made under its uh, force. Now we have a new law uh, uh, that establishes a, a new framework for foreign, foreign direct investment. Uh, and this, is, this legislation is complementary to the international uh, treaties that we have uh, analyzed before. So, um, well, this is, we have reached to the end of this presentation. Thank, thank you very much for your attendance and, and your interest in this process that is starting, but uh, I'm sure that will be uh, very, be, we will rise a lot of discussions about the hot topics that we have reviewed. And now we are, completely available for your questions about uh, these issues. So if anyone has a question, we, we do not have any questions in written in the chat box, but um, if, you want, if anyone wants to turn the camera on and, and the mic, um, in, in any case, I, I can open with, with, I have one question uh, in connection with the political situation in the country. We are having uh, elections for president and parliament in the following two months in November. So what could happen with, with, with those authorities that will be elected now uh, if the new constitution is approved by the exit uh, levisit. Um, could, could they, well, and, and what could, would happen also because we are electing now a bicameral parliament, so deputies and senate, and then could the, the constitution establish a, just one camera? Um, so any words on, on, on the political situation of the authorities that will be elected in the next couple of months? Well, that, 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 that's the good news for lawyers, Sergio, because when this process happens uh, everywhere, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, discussions on how these rules will apply one to each other. 
Uh, we've seen that in in Iceland, in Colombia, and, and in Bolivia, in Ecuador, and in other jurisdictions. They, <clears throat> it is one thing to adopt a new constitution, but then you have, as you may remember from the Kelsen uh, pyramid, uh, hundreds or thousands of rules that need to be interpreted in accordance with that constitution. So uh, for a very broad issue as the one that you are raising, for instance, what happened if uh, the conventional, the constitutional convention uh, adopts a unicameral uh, Congress, uh, something like that, you would expect them uh, to have uh, transitory rules as, as we call them, right? So the, the constitutions and just like uh, bylaws, in a in a company they do have a set of permanent rules but also at the end they have what we call the transitory rules and when you do have those type of issues of conflicts you will handle them by adopting a transitory rule in the example that you are given uh, it may say that the unicameral uh, congress will start uh, by the end of the four years of the actual one in in place for instance uh, that's that's the type of things that uh, should be handled, but I can <clears throat> I, I can assure you that would be hundreds of issues that are not going to be handled in that careful way, and we will have uh, uh, legal discussions uh, over the years. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Fernanda, Nicolás, Jose, and Sergio for your words. I don't think we have any questions right now on the chat. We will be sharing this uh, event uh, via email for you to review. Um, and I think that's it for now. <laughs> yeah, Natalia, so and, uh, one final uh, note. Uh, we are in Barrios y Rasulis, in our law firm, we are uh, issuing newsletters by this constitutional committee every couple of weeks um, for our clients so if everyone wants to be to receive those newsletters just let us know and we can include you in the in the mailing list okay thank you very much well thanks to ahaka as well for having us uh, on explaining this complicated topic and we hope we, we can meet in a new future again. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you for our AHACA members abroad. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.